Hello, and welcome once again to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My name is Mike Parker, and I'm the instructor for the class. The Hurricane Adult Religion class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Dates, times, and location are available on the class website. Links to the class website are available in the show notes for this video. On the website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint slide presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class, including the one prepared for this lesson. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for these sites and the materials on them. If you enjoyed this lesson, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And subscribe if you want to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. In this lesson, we'll be studying Alma and Amulek's preaching ministry in the land of Zarahemla. This is found in Alma chapters 5 through 16. The key individuals in this lesson are Alma was the son of Alma. After an angel visited him, he renounced his former wickedness. At the end of the last lesson, he was both chief judge and high priest of the Nephites in the land of Zarahemla. Amulek was a resident of Ammonihah who repented and became Alma's preaching companion. Zeezrom was a corrupt lawyer in the city of Ammonihah. Antiona was a chief ruler in the city of Ammonihah. Zoram was chief captain over the Nephite armies. The outline of events for this is Alma preached in Zarahemla, Alma preached in Gideon, Alma preached in Melech, Alma and Amulek preached in Ammonihah, where they withstood Zeezrom. Alma and Amulek ministered in Sidon. The Nephite army rescued captives taken by the Lamanites. Alma and Amulek preached throughout the land. These events took place in the northern lowlands of the land of Zarahemla, where the Nephite people lived. This lesson covers a period of about five years, beginning in the commencement of the ninth year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi, circa 86 BC, and ending in the 14th year of the reign of the judges, circa 81 BC. Recapping the events in our last lesson, we discussed how King Mosiah established a system of judges to govern the Nephites after he died. Alma was chosen as the first chief judge. He was also high priest over the Church of God. After eight years, Nephite prosperity had led to materialism, contention within the church, and to envyings and strife and malice and persecutions and pride, and thus the church began to fail in its progress. The Nephites' spiritual condition had degraded so badly that in the ninth year of the reign of the judges, Alma gave up the chief judge's seat, but retained the office of high priest so he could embark on a traveling ministry to teach his people. Alma's preaching in Zarahemla is our first example of Alma as an orator. We've already learned that previous to his conversion, Alma was a man of many words and did speak much flattery to the people. In the masterful discourse in Alma chapter 5, he effectively used his eloquence for good purposes. Alma's brilliant oratory style is seen in his use of the rhetorical question, a method of teaching by asking a question that's intended to make the hearer think rather than to elicit an answer. There are 41 rhetorical questions in Alma's discourse in chapter five. Alma's speech was directed to the people in the church, not to non-believers or potential converts. Only in the very last sentence in his sermon did he briefly address those who do not belong to the church. 
As members of Christ Church, we should read this sermon as if Alma were addressing us personally. Alma began his sermon by reminding the people in Zarahemla of the accomplishments of his father, Alma I, in establishing the church in the lands of Nephi and Zarahemla. He asked his first set of soul-searching questions. Have you sufficiently retained in remembrance the captivity of your fathers? Yea, and have you sufficiently retained in remembrance God's mercy and long-suffering towards them? And moreover, have you sufficiently retained in remembrance that he has delivered their souls from hell? Alma's opening message emphasized the importance of remembering the lessons of religious history. It was intended to point the minds of his hearers to the great faith of their fathers and all that God had accomplished through them, much as we could start by examining our own faith, by remembering the early Latter-day Saints who suffered and struggled to establish Zion here in the Intermountain West. In nine years, Alma would testify to his son Helaman, I have always retained in remembrance the captivity experienced by their ancestors, and he would exhort him to retain in remembrance as I have done their captivity. Behold, he declared in verse seven, God changed their hearts. This is the first of eight times that Alma referred to the condition of the heart, five of which refer to a change of heart wrought by God. We'll discuss this in a moment. The followers of his father, Alma I, had been held captive by the bands of death and the chains of hell, physical and spiritual death. But these shackles were loosed and their souls did expand and they did sing redeeming love and they were saved. Alma then asked the key questions. On what conditions are they saved? Yea, what grounds had they to hope for salvation? What is the cause of their being loosed from the bands of death, yea, and also the chains of hell. In other words, he asked his hearers how those who had followed his father received the great blessing of salvation from death and hell. The answer, he taught, is that his father heard the words of God from Abinadi, and according to his faith, there was a mighty change wrought in his heart. And behold, he preached the word unto your fathers, and a mighty change was also wrought in their hearts, and they humbled themselves and put their trust in the true and living God. And behold, they were faithful until the end, therefore they were saved. Having established that salvation is obtained through a mighty change of heart, Alma then turned his questions to his audience and to us, the readers. In a lengthy series of rhetorical questions, Alma pointed his audience's minds forward to the final judgment. Verse 14 is the pivotal passage in this discourse. Quote, And now, behold, I ask of you, my brethren of the church, have ye spiritually been born of God? Have ye received his image in your countenances? Have ye experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Unquote. What does it mean to be born of God? After his conversion experience, the Lord told Alma in Mosiah 27, verses 25 and 26, quote, And the Lord said unto me, Marvel not that all mankind, yea, men and women, all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, must be born again, yea, born of God, changed from their carnal and fallen state to a state of righteousness, being redeemed of God, becoming his sons and daughters. And thus they become new creatures. And unless they do this, they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God." Unquote. After King Benjamin's people had listened to his address and had entered into a covenant to obey God's will, he told them in Mosiah chapter five, verse seven, quote, and now because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day hath he spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. 
Therefore ye are born of him, and have become his sons and his daughters. Unquote. Being born of God involves experience a change in our nature or being. We are changed from our carnal and fallen state to a state of righteousness. This change is accomplished through faith on Christ's name. One month before he was ordained as president of the church, Apostle Ezra Taft Benson taught, quote, the Lord works from the inside out. The world works from the outside in. The world would take people out of the slums. Christ takes the slums out of people, and then they take themselves out of the slums. The world would mold men by changing their environment. Christ changes men who then change their environment. The world would shape human behavior, but Christ can change human nature. Christ changes men, and changed men can change the world." Unquote. What did Alma mean when he asked, have you received God's image in your countenances? 19th century U.S. novelist Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote a short story titled The Great Stone Face, in which a young man named Ernest gazed intently at an immense rock in which nature had chiseled a man's face with noble features. Ernest so desired to be the hero that local legend said was depicted by this face, that eventually his own face assumed a grandeur of expression so imbued with benevolence and people exclaimed, Behold, behold, Ernest is himself the likeness of the great stone face. In a 1951 General Conference address, President David O. McKay recalled Hawthorne's story and commented, quote, What a man continually thinks about determines his actions in times of opportunity and stress. A man's reaction to his appetites and impulses when they are aroused gives the measure of that man's character. In these reactions are revealed the man's power to govern or his forced servility to yield." Unquote. President James E. Faust taught, quote, a sacred light comes to our eyes and countenances when we have a personal bond with our loving Heavenly Father and His Son, our Savior and Redeemer. With this bond, our faces will mirror that sublime assurance that he lives." Unquote. Why is it that, according to the scriptures, the heart must experience this mighty change? One popular Bible dictionary explains, quote, the Hebrews thought of the whole human being and personality with all its physical, intellectual, and psychological attributes when they used heart. It was considered the governing center for all of these. It is the heart, the core, which makes and identifies the person. Character, personality, will, and mind are modern terms which all reflect something of the meaning of heart in its biblical usage." Unquote. Alma was calling for a mighty and complete change of the total person, our character, personality, will, and mind. Sister Neil F. Marriott of the Young Women General Presidency taught, quote, when we open ourselves to the Spirit, we learn God's way and feel His will. During the sacrament, I have found that after I pray for forgiveness of sins, it is instructive for me to ask Heavenly Father, Father, is there more? When we are yielded and still, our minds can be directed to something more we may need to change, something that is limiting our capacity to receive spiritual guidance or even healing and help. True worship begins when our hearts are right before the Father and the Son. What is our heart condition today? Paradoxically, in order to have a healed and faithful heart, we must first allow it to break before the Lord. Ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit, the Lord declares. 
The result of sacrificing our heart or our will to the Lord is that we receive the spiritual guidance we need." Unquote. Alma contrasted those who have exercised faith in the redemption and look forward with an eye of faith, to whom the Lord will say at the last day, Come unto me, ye blessed, for behold, your works have been the works of righteousness, with those who set at defiance the commandments of God, yielded themselves to become subjects of the devil, and whose garments are stained with blood and all manner of filthiness, whom the Lord will cast out, for they are children of the kingdom of the devil. There were some in Alma's audience who had been born of God and had their hearts changed. Alma issued a challenge to them. Alma chapter 5, verses 26 through 32, quote, And now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, if ye have experienced a change of heart, and if ye have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask, can ye feel so now? Have ye walked, keeping yourselves blameless before God? Could ye say, if ye were called to die at this time, within yourselves, that ye have been sufficiently humble, that your garments have been cleansed and made white through the blood of Christ, who will come to redeem his people from their sins? Behold, are ye stripped of pride? I say unto you, if ye are not, ye are not prepared to meet God. Behold, ye must prepare quickly, for the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand, and such an one hath not eternal life. Behold, I say, is there one among you who is not stripped of envy? I say unto you that such an one is not prepared, and I would that he should prepare quickly, for the hour is close at hand, and he knoweth not when the time shall come, for such an one is not found guiltless. And again I say unto you, is there one among you that doth make a mock of his brother, or that heapeth upon him persecutions? Woe unto such an one, for he is not prepared, and the time is at hand that he must repent, or he cannot be saved. Yea, even woe unto all ye workers of iniquity, repent, repent, for the Lord God hath spoken it." Unquote. Alma promised those who do repent that the Lord stands with open arms, ready to receive them. Those who will not repent, though, are as sheep having no shepherd, notwithstanding a shepherd hath called after you and is still calling after you, but ye will not hearken unto his voice. These people have a shepherd, but that shepherd is the devil. Our works determine who our shepherd is. Alma concluded his address by affirming that he had spoken unto you plainly that ye cannot err. He had been commanded to testify of these things, and the things he had spoken were true and had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit of God. He testified of Christ and commanded all men and women to repent. He warned that those who will not repent will be destroyed, while those who do repent must separate themselves from the wicked and become the Lord's sheep. Alma's exhortation to the members of the church in Zarahemla is one of the great sermons in the Book of Mormon and in all of Scripture. It reminds those who already believe and have made baptismal covenants to continually experience a mighty change in our hearts, humble ourselves, repent, and seek God's salvation. Alma set the church at Zarahemla in order by ordaining priests and elders, baptizing those who repented, and excommunicating those who would not repent. The people of the Church of God did gather themselves together oft and join in fasting and mighty prayer in behalf of the welfare of the souls of those who knew not God. Alma then traveled from the city of Zarahemla to the nearby city of Gideon. He told the people of Gideon that he had given up the office of chief judge in order to preach. Alma said that he rejoiced in finding that the members of the church in Gideon were righteous and humble, unlike their brethren in Zarahemla. He testified that Christ, the Redeemer, shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, 
that he would suffer and die for the sins of his people, and that he would appear to the people of Nephi. He commanded the people to repent and be born again, and to lay aside every sin which easily doth beset you. Those who would do so shall have eternal life. Alma knew by the Spirit of God that the people of Gideon believed him, and that they were walking in the path of God. He concluded by asking of them in Alma chapter 7, verses 23 through 25, quote, And now I would that ye should be humble, and be submissive and gentle, easy to be entreated, full of patience and long-suffering, being temperate in all things, being diligent in keeping the commandments of God at all times, asking for whatsoever things ye stand in need, both spiritual and temporal, always returning thanks unto God for whatsoever things ye do receive, and see that ye have faith, hope, and charity, and then ye will always abound in good works. And may the Lord bless you, and keep your garments spotless, that ye may at last be brought to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the holy prophets who have been ever since the world began, having your garments spotless, even as their garments are spotless, in the kingdom of heaven, to go no more out." Unquote. I'm struck by Alma's teaching that we should ask God for the things we need, but that we should give thanks to him for whatever we receive from him, even, I take it, if we receive something we didn't ask for or don't want. This is similar to the promise given by the Lord through Joseph Smith in March 1832 that he who receiveth all things with thankfulness shall be made glorious. Alma left the people of Gideon with a blessing of peace and prosperity. After establishing the church there, Alma returned home to Zarahemla. His combined ministry in these two cities lasted a full year. In the following year, the 10th year of the Judges, circa 85 BC, Alma preached in the land of Melech. Mormon didn't include a record of what Alma taught in Melech, but he did tell us that people throughout all the borders of the land, which was by the wilderness side, came to Alma to be baptized. Alma left Melech and traveled three days north to the city of Ammonihah. Despite laboring much in the spirit, wrestling with God in mighty prayer, Alma was unsuccessful in Ammonihah. The people there had given their hearts to Satan and considered his teachings foolish traditions. They treated Alma with contempt and cast him out of the city. With great sorrow and anguish, Alma left Ammonihah and journeyed toward the city of Aaron. As he traveled, the same angel who had appeared to him and the sons of Mosiah nearly 30 years ago visited him again. The angel blessed Alma for keeping God's commandments and instructed him to return to Ammonihah and preach to the people there that they must repent or be destroyed. Alma obeyed the angel and returned to Ammonihah. This time he didn't immediately announce his presence to the people. In the city he met Amulek, a Nephite who had been visited by the same angel who appeared to Alma. The angel told Amulek that a prophet of God would come and that he should receive that prophet into his house. Amulek took Alma into his home and provided him with food and shelter. Alma introduced himself and told Amulek about his failed mission and the angel's command and blessed him. The Lord then told Alma by revelation to take Amulek as his preaching companion. The Lord said that together they were to cry repentance to the people of Ammonihah. Alma and Amulek went forth in the power of God. At first, the people of Ammonihah believed that Alma was still acting alone, and they were unimpressed by his testimony. They said they would not believe Alma's preaching, even if he were to prophesy that Ammonihah would be destroyed in a single day. As they tried to lay their hands on him, Alma began to preach boldly. He reminded them how God blessed Lehi and protected their forefathers and told them of the Lord's command to repent or be destroyed. 
He also taught the principle of where much is given, much is required. Alma chapter 9, verses 14 through 16, and 23 through 24. Quote, Now I would that ye should remember that inasmuch as the Lamanites have not kept the commandments of God, they have been cut off from the presence of the Lord. Now we see that the word of the Lord has been verified in this thing, and the Lamanites have been cut off from his presence from the beginning of their transgressions in the land. Nevertheless, I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment than for you, if ye remain in your sins, yea, and even more tolerable for them in this life than for you, except ye repent. For there are many promises which are extended to the Lamanites, for it is because of their traditions of their fathers that cause them to remain in their state of ignorance. Therefore, the Lord will be merciful unto them and prolong their existence in the land. And now behold, I say unto you, that if this people, who have received so many blessings from the hand of the Lord, should transgress, contrary to the light and knowledge which they do have, I say unto you, that if this be the case, that if they should fall into transgression, it would be far more tolerable for the Lamanites than for them. For behold, the promises of the Lord are extended to the Lamanites, but they are not unto you if ye transgress. For has not the Lord expressly promised and firmly decreed that if ye will rebel against him, that ye, sh ye shall utterly be destroyed from off the face of the earth? Unquote. The Nephites and the Lamanites had received covenant promises from the Lord, but because of the state of ignorance the Lamanites were under due to their traditions, Alma taught that the Lord would be more merciful to them. They didn't know any better because they hadn't been taught correctly by their fathers. Alma warned the people of Ammonihah, if ye persist in your wickedness, your days shall not be prolonged in the land, for the Lamanites shall be sent unto you, and if ye repent not, ye shall be visited with utter destruction. As we'll see, this revealed warning came to pass. Alma concluded by testifying of the coming of Christ in glory to judge all mankind, and he exhorted the people of Ammonihah to repent and prepare for that day. Because Alma had accused them of being a hard-hearted and a stiff-necked people, the people of Ammonihah were angry with him, but the Lord did not permit them to imprison Alma yet. Then Amulek went and stood forth, and began to preach unto them also. Amulek began by establishing his credentials, including his lineage and his reputation among the people of the city. He then told the people of the angel's appearance to him, and testified of Alma's authority. The people were astonished to see that Alma had an additional witness of his message. Some of them were lawyers, hired or appointed by the people to administer the law at trial, and learned in all the arts and cunning of the people. These men questioned Amulek in order to trap him and find some way to accuse him of violating their law. Amulek, however, perceived their intentions and reproved them for their wickedness and iniquities. He prophesied that they would be destroyed by pestilence and by the sword. The people became even more angry at this, and they accused Amulek of slandering their law and their lawyers. Amulek boldly responded that Satan had power over the hearts of the people. He protested, Ye say that I have spoken against your law, but I have not, but have spoken in favor of your law, to your condemnation. And now behold, I say unto you, that the foundation of the destruction of this people is beginning to be laid by the unrighteousness of your lawyers and your judges. The people of Ammonihah were outraged that Amulek had criticized their lawyers and judges and accused him of being a child of the devil. At this point, the text introduces Zeezrom, a prominent lawyer of Ammonihah. To help us understand what Zeezrom was about to propose, Mormon first explained the bribery and corruption that was taking place in the Nephite legal religious system and the Nephite system of weights and measures. The intent of the lawyers of Ammonihah was to get gain through their employment. Judges received wages for their time spent judging the cases that were brought before them. Those who owed debts were apprehended and brought to judgment. The lawyers benefited from this system by stirring up the people to riotings and all manner of disturbances and wickedness, 
that they might have more employ. The arrangement described by Mormon at the beginning of chapter 11 was not a system of coinage or a monetary system. Rather, it was a system of weights and measures that had been established by King Mosiah. Ancient societies didn't use coins or currency. Instead, they used a set of standardized weights on a balance to measure out grain or precious metals that were exchanged for labor, services, or goods. The Nephites used theirs to measure barley and every kind of grain, as well as silver. BYU professor John W. Welch has demonstrated that the Nephite system is an elegant, complex, and yet practical system of measures that could measure both small and large amounts with a minimal number of pieces. I've prepared a handout for this lesson about the Nephite system of weights and measures. Click the link in the description to download this handout. Zeezrom attempted to bribe Amulek into denying the existence of a god in exchange for six aunties of silver. An aunty was equal to seven senums, each of which was the equivalent of one day's wages for a judge. So Zeezrom was offering Amulek the equivalent of 42 days wages or seven weeks income. Amulek vehemently refused Zeezrom's bribe and accused him of both knowing that God existed and also of not intending to pay Amulek, even if he had denied the existence of God. Zeezrom interrogated Amulek about God and salvation. He asked Amulek, shall the son of God save his people in their sins? When Amulek said he would not, Zeezrom twisted Amulek's response, claiming that he had said that the son of God shall come, but he shall not save his people. Amulek explained that Christ cannot save us in our sins because no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ saves us from our sins, but he cannot save us in our sins, meaning if we persist in them. Zeezrom asked Amulek if the Son of God is the Eternal Father. Amulek explained that the Son of God is the very Eternal Father of heaven and earth, who will redeem his people and judge the wicked. He also taught a universal perfect resurrection, followed by God's judgment. Alma 11 verses 42 through 44, quote, Now there is a death which is called a temporal death, and the death of Christ shall loose the bands of this temporal death, that all shall be raised from this temporal death. The spirit and the body shall be reunited again in its perfect form. Both limb and joint shall be restored to its proper frame, even as we now are at this time, and which shall be brought to stand before God, knowing even as we know now, and have a bright recollection of all our guilt. Now this restoration shall come to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female, both the wicked and the righteous. And even there shall not so much as a hair of their heads be lost, but every thing shall be restored to its proper frame, as it is now, or in the body, and shall be brought and be arraigned before the bar of Christ the Son, and God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, which is one eternal God, to be judged according to their works, whether they be good or whether they be evil." Unquote. Amulek's teaching astonished the people and rattled Zeezrom. Alma then stepped in to establish the words of Amulek and to unfold the scriptures beyond that which Amulek had done. In front of a large crowd, Alma accused Zeezrom of being caught in a lie a plan that Zeezrom concocted to bring the people of Ammonihah in subjection to the devil. Zeezrom was noticeably shaken. He was convinced more and more of the power of God, and that Alma and Amulek knew his thoughts. He asked, apparently sincerely, to know more about the resurrection and God's final judgment. Alma first explained two important truths. Alma 12, verses 9 through 11, quote, And now Alma began to expound these things unto him, saying, It is given unto many to know the mysteries of God. 
Nevertheless, they are laid under a strict command that they shall not impart only according to the portion of his word which he doth grant unto the children of men, according to the heed and diligence which they give unto him. And therefore he that will harden his heart, the same receiveth the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the word, until it is given unto him to know the mysteries of God, until he know them in full. And they that will harden their hearts, to them is given the lesser portion of the word, until they know nothing concerning his mysteries. Then they are taken captive by the devil, and led by his will down to destruction. Now this is what is meant by the chains of hell." Unquote. The first truth is that many people know the mysteries of God, but they are laid under a strict command that they shall not impart all they know, but only the portion of his word which God doth grant unto the children of men, according to the heed and diligence which they give unto him. The second truth is that those who open their hearts will receive more and more light and knowledge from God until they know them in full, while those who harden their hearts have that which they know taken from them until they know nothing concerning God's mysteries, and they are captives of the devil. Therefore, the doctrine of line upon line, precept upon precept, works both ways. Those who continueth in God receiveth more light, and do so until they are glorified in truth and knoweth all things. While he who refuses to repent, from him shall be taken even the light which he has received. If we harden our hearts against the light of God, Alma declared that when we stand before God, our words will condemn us, yea, all our works will condemn us, we shall not be found spotless, and our thoughts will also condemn us. And in this awful state, we shall not dare to look up to our God, and we would fain, that is to say, wish, desire to, be glad if we could command the rocks and the mountains to fall upon us, to hide us from his presence. We will then acknowledge to our everlasting shame that all God's judgments are just, that he is just in all his works, and we will be held captive eternally by the second death. The crowd continued to grow more astonished. Antiona, a chief ruler among them, asked Alma to explain the resurrection and the immortality of the soul in light of the fact that Adam and Eve were forced out of Eden, and therefore there was no possibility they could live forever. Alma explained that, because of Adam's fall, all mankind became a lost and fallen people. If Adam had been permitted to eat of the tree of life, there would have been no death for him and his descendants, which would have violated God's warning to Adam and Eve. Alma explained, quote, And thus we see that death comes upon mankind, yea, the death which has been spoken of by Amulek, which is the temporal death. Nevertheless, there was a space granted unto man in which he might repent. Therefore, this life became a probationary state, a time to prepare to meet God, a time to prepare for that endless state which has been spoken of by us, which is after the resurrection of the dead." Unquote. Fortunately, God prepared the plan of salvation from the foundation of the world to bring to pass the resurrection. If Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree of life, the plan of redemption would have been frustrated. That's why they had to be forced out of Eden. Since that time, Adam's descendants have been taught the plan of redemption, given commandments, and commanded to repent by the ministering of angels. Therefore, we should repent and not harden our hearts and provoke God. Alma next turned to the subject of priesthood authority. He may have mentioned authority at this point because the lawyers in Ammonihab were experts in religious law and were in a contest with Alma over his authority to teach the people of Ammonihah. Since the time of Adam and Eve, the Lord God has ordained priests after the order of the Son of God to teach the plan of redemption. These priests were called and prepared from the foundation of the world according to the foreknowledge of God on account of their exceeding faith and good works. Once born into mortality, 
they were called to this holy calling on account of their faith, while others would reject the Spirit of God on account of the hardness of their hearts and blindness of their minds. This order of the priesthood was after the order of his son, which order was from the foundation of the world, being without beginning of days or end of years. Those who accept it become high priests forever and are redeemed of God. Although Alma was teaching about the priesthood authority of God, his instructions are also important because they indirectly teach about the premortal existence of souls and foreordination. These doctrines are only hinted at in ancient scriptures, but this is the most explicit passage about them and the only one in the Book of Mormon. Alma next rehearsed the history of Melchizedek, who was a high priest after this same order. This priesthood is a type of Melchizedek's order of the priesthood. With it, Melchizedek did preach repentance unto his people and establish peace, which is why the city where he reigned was called Salem. Alma was high priest over the land of Zarahemla. By teaching about Melchizedek and his people, he was probably contrasting the wicked people of Ammonihah and their response to the teaching of a high priest with Melchizedek's repentant people when he taught them as their high priest. Alma then cried out, Now is the time to repent, for the day of salvation draweth nigh. The Lord had sent his message to his people in plain terms that we may understand that we cannot err. Angels were declaring it to men and women in Alma's day, and angels would one day declare Christ's appearance in mortality. Therefore, Alma concluded, cast off your sins and do not procrastinate the day of your repentance, but humble yourselves before the Lord. He prayed, may the Lord grant unto you repentance. Many people in Ammonihah believed Alma and Amulek's teachings and repented, but the majority of them were angry and had the two men arrested and tried. Zeezrom had been convinced of the truth of Alma and Amulek's message and tried to testify on their behalf, but the people abused him and cast him out of the city. All the men who believed Alma and Amulek were also cast out of the city and pursued by people who tried to stone them. The wives and children of the men who believed Alma and Amulek were put to death by fire while the two prophets were forced to watch the awful scene. Alma chapter 14, verses 10 through 13, quote, And when Amulek saw the pains of the women and children who were consuming in the fire, he was also pained. And he said unto Alma, How can we witness this awful scene? Therefore let us stretch forth our hands and exercise the power of God which is in us, and save them from the flames. But Alma said unto him, The Spirit constraineth me, that I must not stretch forth mine hand. For behold, the Lord receiveth them up unto himself in glory. And he doth suffer that they may do this thing, or that the people may do this thing unto them, according to the hardness of their hearts, that the judgments which he shall exercise upon them in his wrath may be just. And the blood of the innocent shall stand as a witness against them, yea, and cry mightily against them at the last day. Now Amulek said unto Alma, Behold, perhaps they will burn us also. And Alma said, Be it according to the will of the Lord. But behold, our work is not finished. Therefore they burn us not. Unquote. In 1966, then Elder Spencer W. Kimball authored an article titled Tragedy or Destiny for the church magazine Improvement Era. In it, he taught, quote, now we find many people critical when a righteous person is killed, a young father or mother is taken from a family, or when the violent deaths occur. Some become bitter when oft-repeated prayers seem unanswered. Some lose faith and turn sour when solemn administrations by holy men seem to be ignored and no restoration seems to come from repeated prayer circles. But if all the sick were healed, if all the righteous were protected, and the wicked destroyed, the whole program of the Father would be annulled, and the basic principle of the gospel, free agency, would be ended. 
If pain and sorrow and total punishment immediately followed the doing of evil, no soul would repeat a misdeed. If joy and peace and rewards were instantaneously given the doer of good, there could be no evil. All would do good, and not because of the rightness of doing good. There would be no test of strength, no development of character, no gr growth of powers, no free agency, no satanic controls. Should all prayers be immediately answered according to our selfish desires and our limited understanding, then there would be little or no suffering, sorrow, disappointment, or even death. And if these were not, there would also be an absence of joy, success, resurrection, eternal life, and godhood." Unquote. After being forced to watch believers and their scriptures consumed by fire, Alma and Amulek were thrown into prison and repeatedly abused and mocked, but they refused to say anything to their captors. After being abused in prison for three months, Alma cried out to the Lord for deliverance. The earth shook, the walls of the prison fell upon their captors, and Alma and Amulek walked out as free men. The people of Ammonihah fled from them in terror. Alma and Amulek departed Ammonihah for the land of Sidon, where they found the men of Ammonihah who had believed their message and had been cast out of the city. Zeezrom was there too, sick with a burning fever caused by the anguish he felt for his sins and the role he played in Alma and Amulek's suffering. When he heard the prophets were alive, he called for them and confessed his belief in Christ, whereupon they miraculously healed him and then baptized him. Alma established the church in the land of Sidon, but the people of Ammonihah refused to repent. After this, Alma returned home to Zarahemla, where he took Amulek into his own house as his guest. To visualize the scope of the conflict in Alma chapter 16, it's important to understand that Nephite lands at this time were bounded on the south, on the west, and on the east by wilderness areas that were inhabited by Lamanites. The south wilderness separated the Nephites in the land of Zarahemla from the main body of Lamanites in the highlands of the land of Nephi. The more idle part of the Lamanites lived on the west of the land of Zarahemla in the borders by the seashore. Also, there were many Lamanites on the east by the seashore where the Nephites had driven them. And thus, the Nephites were nearly surrounded by the Lamanites. The city of Ammonihah where Alma and Amulek had preached, was near the western wilderness. Four months after Alma and Amulek's escape from Ammonihah, a Lamanite army secretly made their way north through the western wilderness and attacked Ammonihah and other places in the land of Noah. They killed many people and took others captive. Zoram, chief captain over the Nephite armies, raised a force of men and led them to free the captive Nephites. He first asked Alma for a revelation on where they should look for the Lamanite invaders. Alma inquired of the Lord concerning the matter, and Alma returned and said unto them, Behold, the Lamanites will cross the river Sidon in the south wilderness, away up beyond the borders of the land of Manti. And behold, there shall ye meet them on the east of the river Sidon, and there the Lord will deliver unto thee thy brethren, who have been taken captive by the Lamanites. Zoram's army crossed the river Sidon north of Manti and marched upstream to intercept the Lamanite army in the south wilderness. They met the Lamanites in battle, rescued all the prisoners, and scattered the Lamanites. Mormon noted that in one day the city of Ammonihah was left desolate, that every living soul of the Ammonihahites was destroyed, and also their great city. And this destruction by the Lamanites had been in fulfillment of the prophecies of Alma and Amulek. There were so many dead that the carcasses were mangled by dogs and wild beasts of the wilderness. And the best that the Nephites could do was pile the bodies and cover them with a thin layer of dirt. The land was uninhabitable for many years because of the stench of death. The Nephites called this event 
the desolation of Nehor's, because the people of Ammonihah had been the followers of Nehor's teachings. For the next four years, Alma and Amulek continued preaching and establishing the church throughout the land. The priests of the Church of God taught the people to flee sin and wickedness, and the Lord poured out his spirit upon the people. That brings us to the end of this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button to give it a like and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download the notes and slideshow and handout for this lesson. Next week's lesson will present us with another flashback. We'll back up 14 years and learn what happened to the sons of Mosiah during their mission to the Lamanites. The reading is Alma 17 through 29. See you then.